Very. What's up? What's up? <laughs> See? Yeah. Oh, really? What's her name? I heard Mrs. Brown call her Mary the name <laughs> Mary? Let's play though. Mary? Hey, you. Over there. What's your name? Mary. <laughs> Mary, Mary, for Mary, for Mary, Mary, for Mary, for Mary, for Mary, for Mary. from school and some girls were teasing me about my name. Mama, why did you have to name me Mary? They said it's just <coughs> a plain old simple name. No, sweetie, let Mama talk to you. Do you know who else's name was Mary? No. Jesus' mother name was Mary. She was an innocent young girl just like you. But one day an angel appeared from heaven to tell her that she was chosen to give birth to the Son of God, and he came to save man from their sins and heal the land. Jesus was about eight, 12 years of age. He began to go about his father's business, teaching and preaching and healing the land and really? healing the people, yes. But you know, some people just didn't like Jesus. Why? I don't know, but what they did they started plotting to kill him. What was his father's business? Jesus' business was the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God was about the hidden power of God that is within man. As throngs of people followed Jesus, he told a riddle of a sower who sowed seeds that fell on four different types of soil. Jesus said, some seeds fell on stony places with a little soil. They sprang up, but when the sun hit them because they had no root, they scorched and died. Some seed, he said, fell among weeds, and the weeds choked them out. Still others fell on beaten paths, and the birds ate them up. Only one soil, which was the good ground, did the seeds catch hold and grow. The disciples did not understand why Jesus spoke to the people in a riddle. And neither did they themselves understand the riddle. So when they got away from the people, they asked Jesus why he spoke in a riddle. Jesus then explained the parable. Jesus said, I himself am the sower. The seed is the information that I'm going to give. The soil is the four types of people in that crowd that we just left. One fourth of them, said Jesus, uh, are like a beaten path. They've been walked on. They've been abused. They've been misused. They've been used. They've been mistreated to. They've been lied to. They've been lied on. They've been lied about so much that they won't believe this word that I'm going to drop on them. Still another quarter had thorns uh, about them and the stones would choke it out and rule by, they're ruled by the thinking of the world. And then still another uh, fell on stony rock and which means that when adversity comes, they have a little bit of the understanding, but it quickly falls away. They quickly turn around. They quickly give up. Paul in 1 Corinthians said, we have a hidden treasure in earthen vessels. Then Jesus told a series of parables, all referring to this invisible, valuable, hidden power of God that resides within man. He said, finally in Luke 17 and 21, uh, there were those who will say low here and low there, but the kingdom of God is not a geographical location and neither, he said, can you find it by observation. It's not a physical thing. What is that invisible, powerful, valuable thing that we either retain or discard? It is the mind. So the father's business was empowerment. 
when he talked about empowerment empowerment is knowing who you are and Jesus went about the business of teaching the people that they were not physical protoplasm but divine children of God yes Jesus was talking about a revolution all right he was talking about an overthrow of the government but his revolution was a revolution of the mind and an overthrow of the government of the minds of the brainwashed people this business of the father was dangerous business because it threatened the status quo and presaged the end of economic exploitation of the Hebrews by the Roman imperialistic interlopers these Roman intruders on Jerusalem justly hated Jesus and they sought to get rid of them and so now Jesus is in the end of three years of teaching his disciples in the mysteries of the kingdom and he gathers them together for the last supper to see what type of soil his seed had fallen on. Take it and eat it, for this is my body. Drink from this cup, for this is my blood, which seals the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus says in Matthew 18 and 20 that whenever two or three are gathered in his name, that he would be in the midst. But whenever two or three are gathered in his name, Satan is also always in the midst. In the book of Job, it is recorded that when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan came also with them. That is to say, one of the sons of God was Satan. Whenever oppressed people try to cast off the shackles of spiritual, mental, and social enslavement, someone is always there. Some brainwashed, wicked, insecure, petty, egotistical, mad mind betrayer. Such was the case among Jesus' disciples as he gathered them for the last time. Judas did not betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus betrayed Judas Jesus betray, Judas betrayed Jesus because he was jealous and envious. When a woman of disrepute, a former prostitute, uh, came to Jesus to anoint him with alabaster of ointment, all of the disciples were indignant, but Judas especially so. Judas did not betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver because John 12 tells us that he was the treasure and he was already stealing the money. And as furthermore, he was with Jesus. If he needed some money, all he had to do was ask. So it was about jealousy and envy. It was after this incident that he went out to betray Jesus. In the last, Jesus repeats, in the last supper Jesus repeats for the last time a lesson that he had taught every day for three years. For 
The book of Acts says that they broke bread daily. Jesus had taught his disciples the Beatitudes, the right mental attitudes, the right attitudes to have in dealing with people. As disciples of Jesus, their task was to listen to Jesus, observe Jesus, and follow everything that Jesus did until they could perfectly imitate him. That is what a disciple is. At this Last Supper, for the last time, I hear Jesus again teaching his last lesson. He says to them, this wine represents my blood and this bread represents my body. I want you to get this. I want you to grasp the deeper meaning of this wine and this bread. Y'all remember the Mosaic law. Jesus said we were taught that the blood is the life thereof. So when you drink this wine and eat this bread, you are taking me into you. My spirit, my mind, my thinking, my heart for righteousness, my compassion for people, my love for the Father. This wine and this blood represents me as my disciples. When you think like I, you ought to think like I think. Feel like I feel, act like I act, know what I know, see what I see, do what I do, have the faith that I have, manifest the power that I manifest. Do you understand? Do you understand? This is the last time I'll teach you this. It's not about worshiping me, it's about getting like me. Peter, what about you? You always have a question. Do you get it, Peter? James and John, you two gangbangers, you sons of thunder, do you get it? Andrew, you never understand. Do you get it? Well, let us seal this agreement. Let us seal it uh, so that for once and forever we will be of the same mind and the same spirit and the same judgment with no divisions among us perfectly joined together so let us eat and let us drink to our ancestor Abraham and to Moses and to Solomon and to David and for our other ancestors Mama Tamar and Mama Rachab in the name of the God of our fathers amen amen and amen
you're holy. You're holy, you're holy. You're holy, you're holy. You're holy, you're holy. You're righteous, you're righteous. You're righteous, you're righteous. You're righteous, you're righteous. You're righteous, you're righteous. <laughs> Life in Rome for the Hebrews was pure hell. In many ways, life under the Roman imperialistic power was a life experience of continuing exile in a foreign land. In their own homeland of Jerusalem, they could not practice religion as they wanted. They could not praise God like they wanted. They could not shout and dance like they wanted. They could not do what they do. Jerusalem had been controlled by Rome since 63 BC. And Jesus' people were suffering miserably. They were losing their land, losing their jobs, paying higher taxes every day. But the people's hopes were raised by Jesus' response to their oppression. The people also had been repeatedly told how Judas Maccabeus had led a victorious three-year guerrilla war when Antiochus Epiphanes conquered Jerusalem in 167 BC. Jesus' appearance on the scene made these Hebrews think that perhaps Jesus would lead an armed revolt and overthrow the Roman government. Thus in Jesus the people saw a day very soon when God would deliver them from oppression. The people's hopes were not only raised by the miracles Jesus performed and the stories about the Maccabean revolt, but the Old Testament prophecies were full of anticipation of the day when God would deliver them from oppression. Isaiah prophesied that in Jerusalem was to be a new king from the family of David, a shoot from the root of Jesse, and the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. Again, Isaiah's vision was of a renewed society and for renewal of human life. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lamb shall leap with the deer. Thus in Jesus the people saw the possible fulfillment of both of these prophecies. And so Jesus, constant nemesis, the Pharisees and Sadducees sought to get rid of Jesus and have him crucified. They instigated negative attitudes about Jesus. They trumped up false charges against him and sought one from among Jesus' disciples to betray him. him, him, him.
me to release to you. Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? Well, what am I to do with Jesus? This man has done no wrong. Shout it to everyone. Release me. Ah, release me. Ah. 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 I wash my hands of this matter. Find no fault in this man. He's done no wrong. I shall not chastise him. For that reason, I shall release him unto you. Stretched him high. After they had beaten him with many lashes, he never said a mumbling word.
people's dreams were shattered people's hopes were dashed the people's faith was shaken the disciples went back to being fishers of men instead of fishers of fish instead of fishers of men they did not understand that life moves in cycles of death burial and resurrection seeds must die be buried in the earth only to burst forth into new life as a beautiful flowering plant bright daylight goes into nighttime darkness only to rise the next day as a bright sunlight morning in the frosty arms of winter a tree goes to sleep silently refurbishing its strength preparing for the next season of fruitfulness the sap and substance of the tree goes underground but this is not goodbye for the spring it will push its way up into the budding of a new experience there is the fall when the leaves turn brown winter's cold blitz is challenged by warmer days and the frosty icicles begin to drip and diminish slowly the earth changes its clothes for a new season in spring the sun liberates us from our wintry cocoons in the morning light buds turn to blossoms and summer the blossoms show their fruit in all life there is death burial and then resurrection so when you go through dark cloud wintry seasons in your life and you have gross gross dislike for the blinding winds and the key grip of winter seasons always know that the sun will shine after a while resurrection will come patience is a tree whose root is bitter but her fruit is sweet you've got an appointment with destiny and that destiny is resurrection and whatever we work at whatever we struggle with and finally achieve remember that somebody has gone off the map and somebody has gone off the chart and paved the way and paid the price for you to get where you are today i watched the final round of the masters golf tournament last week and i was sight excited when i saw tiger woods was only four strokes behind and i just knew he was going to make one of his patented runs on the back nine and win the masters once again he didn't win but one should remind tiger woods with many years left to play he's already gone off the map and off the chart and set records that will stand for many years but somebody needs to remind tiger woods that long before it was a tiger woods there was a Charles Sifford who paved the way and paid the price. And I am, I'm, it makes me jump off my seat every time I see LeBron James, who in just a short year in the NBA has equaled the records of three all-time greats, Michael Jordan, Oscar Robinson, and Jerry West. But somebody needs to remind him that long before there was a LeBron James, there was an Earl Lords, and there was a Sweetwater Clifton who won a major tournament. I get shout every time. I see the Williams sisters, Venus and Serena, win major tournaments. But somebody needs to remind them that somebody paid the price and paved the way. There was somebody named Althea Gibson who had paid the price and paved the way. I get excited every time I see the track spinters set new records on the 
track. Uh, I get excited about Carl Lewis records. Uh, I get excited about Mo, Maurice Green. Uh, but somebody needs to remind them uh, that long before uh, Mo Green uh, and long before Carl Lewis, uh, there was somebody uh, in Hitler, Germany uh, in 1936 uh, by the name of Jesse Owens. Uh, there's always somebody uh, that paid the price uh, and paved the way. Uh, cry if you have to, uh, but don't cry long uh, because there's one more thing uh, that I've got to tell you uh, that there was somebody uh, who paid the price uh, and paved the way. Uh, there was somebody uh, that they stretched high uh, and they hung him wide uh, and they put a crown on his head. Uh, they put nails in his hands. Uh, they put nails in his feet. Uh, but early uh, on Sunday morning, uh, he got up uh, with all power in his hands. Uh, he got up. Uh, he said, why do you cry? Uh, I am he uh, who was dead, uh, but now I live, uh, and I live uh, forevermore. Uh, somebody shout glory. Somebody say yeah. He rose. Uh, he rose. Uh, he rose uh, from the dead. Uh, he got up. Uh, what you have to know today, uh, we're not having this uh, just because there was a resurrection, uh, but because there is uh, a resurrection going on uh, every time uh, I see somebody get off drugs, uh, there's a resurrection going on uh, every time uh, I see somebody uh, against all odds uh, get an education, uh, there's a resurrection going on uh, because he got up. Uh, got up because he got up you can get up because he got up your brother can get up because he got up your sister can get up he arose he rose he rose he rose he got up with all power all power in heaven and earth say yeah
all of us. I want you to give our cast, first of all, our musical director and uh, co-conceiver along with Sister.